Hey, John, a CEO, a general, and a professor walk into the bar. What do they come out with? Nice try at the joke, David. They came out with a call to action on the U.S. emergency response. Guess we better answer it. Welcome to Care Talk, your weekly home for incisive debate about healthcare business and policy. I'm David Williams, president of Health Business Group. And I'm John Driscoll, the CEO of CareCentric. So David, who do we have joining us this week? Well, John, we had one general. I think we should take a second, and I'll tell you why. We've been lamenting the fact that the U.S. has done poorly on the pandemic response and saying, who's going to help? Who's going to figure out what we need to do in the future? And so, John, I said, dial up another general since we had one before, General McChrystal, and you are able to find yet another winner. We are very lucky today to have... Uh, General uh, Joseph Votel, who has a storied career as a, a warrior and as a leader and as a public servant, who's currently the CEO of Business Executives for National Security, which is a, a bit of a mouthful. Uh, welcome, Joe. Do you want to just first uh, introduce us to kind of who Benz is and what they do? Sure, uh, sure, John. It's great to be with you and David today. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the invitation. So, Benz is a uh, is a national nonprofit made up of business executives from across the nation, uh, east to west, north to south, and and what we do is we share best best business practices with our government partners. You know, if you're going to Abbottabad to get Bin Laden, nobody really cares how much that costs. But if you're if you're uh, the no- the normal stuff of national security is in fact business, and there is an awful lot that can be learned from the expertise of our members. So what we try to do is bring that expertise to real government uh, national security problems and help our partners out. General, you had a a, a remarkable career running J- Joint Special Operations Command and really playing a, a central role in with coalition partners in kind of cracking uh, the, the 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 Islamic Caliphate. What, 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 those are all, it's an unbelievable career. What drew you to this job? Why, why this job right now to give people a perspective on how you're approaching Benz's mission? First off, I had experience with Benz when I was in uniform on several occasions. I had actually reached out to them for, uh, to get some, some experts to come in and help me as we worked through some, some fairly difficult issues. So I had, I had a very good impression in and, and general understanding of what the organization did. Uh, right before I retired, I was called by uh, my predecessor, General Norty Schwartz, who is an officer that I have a great amount of respect for. And he mentioned he would be leaving and asked if I wanted to be considered for this. And I said, sure, expecting never really to hear anything more about it. Uh, but lo and behold, I did. And uh, and uh, so the fact that Norty reached out to me as an officer that I that I really respected and, uh, and had had a very deep and good relationship with, uh, it spoke very highly of the organization. And then finally, the members, the members uh, have sold it to me as I went through the selection process. And and the way I kind of look at it is I think is the way many of my uh, predecessors have looked at it is it's another way to be involved in national security through another means. Uh, so you're out of uniform now, so you're not uh, doing that type of thing, but this is a great way to leverage your expertise, to get to know the business community, and then to really help uh, help move forward on on uh, on hard problems for our government partners. Well, I think the the, the biggest challenge we we've had in national security has really been this pandemic, and so we'd love to talk about how you and Ben's and the Commission on National Response have come up with a quick report card and recommendations um, for the country, but. At least, you know, from a from a from 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 where we sit, I think the the country didn't. The, well, we, while we have very successfully engineered uh, vaccines, it certainly felt like we really weren't prepared for a pandemic that, at, at a lot of different levels, you, you 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 we should have predicted. Well, yeah, I think that's I think that's largely true, and I think uh, as we as we got more and more into the pandemic, I think we began to see where a lot of our challenges um, were, and uh, uh, you know, I, I think we I think we failed to do a few things up front that contributed to some of the some of the problems we have with this. We had we had some very good plans in place that have been developed over a number of years uh, about how to deal with the pandemic. Uh, and yet it seems that we we didn't pay attention to those and we didn't try to implement um, some of those plans. 
we had dismantled a number of offices and relationships over over several years here that had made it very difficult uh, for us to have the right trip wires in place and uh, and the right safety nets in place uh, to, to understand what was happening and how quickly this was moving. And then I think finally, we, we really failed to orchestrate a, an effective um, communication strategy to the American people in, in terms of how we were doing this. As, as everybody would recall, this became fairly political quickly. Uh, and that I think really complicated. And so uh, rather than getting everybody focused on what they needed to do to prevent the spread, uh, I think we lost a lot of valuable time early on as we were trying to get organized for this. And we had we had mechanisms in place to help us with that. Yeah, I think it's pretty clear uh, that the U.S. didn't do a very good job. And, and it's good that Ben's is there in order to convene this commission on the national response. Before we get into some of the lessons learned from it, I mean, are there things that are fundamentally different about COVID from other disasters? Certainly, you mentioned how the uh, you know the response became politicized and and so on. But is, is there something fundamentally different about COVID? Well, I think what's fundamentally different about the pandemic, about the COVID pandemic, is that it was it is a, it was a sustained and nationwide emergency for a long period of time. Our, our emergency response system, it is excellent. It is, it is, it is really good. We've got great people doing this, but it is geared for, uh, for regional, local, shorter duration disasters, uh, tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, natural uh, you know f- fires uh, these a lot of natural disasters that we can uh, that we can deal with in in a relatively short confined period of time what happened with the pandemic and with covid-19 is it persisted it was sustained and it and it affected everybody at once so the demand wasn't just one state one locality one region it was the whole nation and what that ended up doing, I think, is it exposed the vulnerabilities and weaknesses in our in our system. Uh, when everybody is asking for help at the same time, and and we're having to sort through significant priorities and everything as we do this, I think it just really, uh, really exposed a lot of vulnerabilities in our system. And do you think? I mean, for me, the the reason why this is such a pertinent topic. Is is there's nothing more there's there's no greater public disaster than all of the people who've gotten deathly ill and or who passed based on COVID. I mean, if you take Dr. Burks's own predict uh, sort of retrospective view, we could have saved a hundred thousand more souls if we'd gotten our act together. And certainly, New Zealand, Hong Kong, there are other countries that seem to uh, uh, um, Taiwan rather seem to get their act together quickly, at least partially because they had already they they'd sort of seen this. In 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 viral uh, uh, viral sort of explosions with uh, the avian flu, but I, I I think that the 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 thing that's hard to crack from a, a healthcare perspective, you've got a problem with a a federal system, but even a more discombobulated healthcare system, and I I um I just I I, I don't know that we as a country um, are really well suited for a national. Um, uh, sort of viral attack. I, I, I think it sort of it challenges some of the basic structures that 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 that, that the United States has been built on. Uh, I, I would agree with that, and and I don't want to pass myself off as a healthcare expert. I'm a general officer, and by definition, I'm generally knowledgeable about a lot of a lot of things. Uh, but I'm not a healthcare expert on this. But it but it seems to me that what you're saying is correct here. Um, but a, a way of overcoming that. Um, is by strong initial leadership from the federal level uh, to get a plan in place and to establish good communications with people and, uh, and, uh, and, and try to set priorities and make it clear how we're going to, going to approach that. I, I think my personal view is I think we struggled with that in the first, uh, certainly in the first few weeks, but probably the first few months of this. And, and, uh, and I think as anybody would recognize, when you're responding to a disaster, when you're responding to a rapidly developing situation, it is much better to be to get it early on than it is to allow it to to develop, and then you've got a bigger problem uh, to control. So I think we needed to be stronger and more affirmative in our approaches in the early weeks and months of the of the pandemic. So clearly, there's some lessons learned about the role of the federal government versus the state and uh, and local agencies. Uh, what about the role of the private versus the 
public sector. Clearly, you know, we have a strong private sector in this country and the healthcare system is more private than it is elsewhere. How do you think about the role of kind of the private economy versus versus government? Well, I think it's absolutely essential. I mean, the problem statement that we set out when we that we laid out for ourselves uh, when we undertook our commission to to address this was how do we develop a better model for private, public, and civil sector uh, co- cooperation, collaboration, and and communication in times of sustained emergencies like this. Um, so, no doubt, the private sector has a huge. A uh, huge role to play in this, and uh, you know, a lot of the supplies, a lot of the materials, a lot of the necessary tools that we have to address, uh, that are needed to address the situation, reside in the private sector. And so, there has to be effective way of tapping into that. Uh, you know, I think the big lesson learned out of all of this is that the federal government can't do it by itself. The state governments can't do it by itself. It takes this layering approach of of government. Uh, the public sector, the private sector, and civil organizations uh, to really bring all the tools that need to be applied to address a a sustained national emergency like this one was. General, where would you start? I mean, there's, there's, you've sort of called out personal leadership and ownership of the problem. Um, the, the, The second thing you've called out is sort of making sure there's a federal and a, and a state solution, a national and a state solution. How would you, those make sense. I mean, everyone understands, you know, governors and presidents. How would you pull in the private sector and what would you have them do? Uh, Because I don't think um, that this is going to be the last pandemic we're going to deal with. If you look at just zoonotic species, you know, the, 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 the convergence of, uh, of a much more connected world, uh, not just in terms of communication and data, but in terms of biology, um, how, if, if that's a threat that's going to happen and that's a, then that piece you want to do, I, I think of public private partnerships as sort of an unnatural act in some ways in the United States. How would you make it work? Yeah, to some extent it is, but uh, I think there's there's good examples of where this has taken place. I mean, the way that I think about this, John, is, I, I mean, again, I'm a military guy thinking about this here. I, I think one of the things you have to do up front is get your command and control, uh, get your command and control straight. You got to get somebody in charge of this. And the organization that is best suited in our government to handle all kinds of federal uh, disasters is FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. That is what it is designed for. It's not peculiar to to natural disasters. It has got the right people, the right uh, structures, uh, the right uh, you know support to really help manage this. So it's really critical to get the right people in place. And what needs to happen within that is we do need to look at some of the structures that we have within. FEMA that uh, that bring in the private sector and include them in the planning early on. Uh, there is a tendency, frankly, uh, to view the private sector as vendors and not partners in this. And I think this is a big problem. We've, you, I think you, you learn that over time, that uh, they have got to be partners uh, in this. They've got to be incorporated into this. They have to be integrated into the National uh, Response Coordination Cell that, that, seem, that FEMA has. And we've got to make sure that there is a very clear representation uh, in, in these entities right here, right from the, right from the start. Uh, it's absolutely essential. If you don't and try to bring it in later, you're going to miss something. John, I noted in this report that there were uh, 11 different recommendations and across three different categories. And, and maybe we can delve into a couple of the interest, more interesting ones. They're all interesting. But the three categories, as I read them, were about facilitating communication and coordination, delivering supplies and volunteer resources, and, and leveraging technologies. And, and all those had uh, multiple things within it. I mean, one of the things that was interesting on the facilitating communication and coordination, there was a recommendation to expand the inclusion of non-traditional partners. What, what sort of partners are they and what and what kind of role could they play? Certainly, David, it certainly includes businesses uh, and it includes businesses of all, of all sorts. Um, you know, I think what we learned out of the pandemic here is that, uh, you know, there are so many 
different sectors of the business community affected by this over a long period of time, that there needed to be more people brought uh, brought into this. Um, so the first piece is we've got to have a, a more effective way of reaching out to, out to businesses. I think the other aspect is we've got to have a very effective way of working with civic organizations as well. There are a variety of them around the around the around the country. Most of them are locally uh, oriented, but they bring some extraordinary capabilities. If you look at an organization like Team Rubicon, for example, that leverages veteran resources across the nation. Uh, and brings veterans volunteer services to uh, to disaster areas or areas in need. I mean, this is an extraordinary capability that has uh, that has been uh, that has been continued to be refined over time. But there are, but there are more out there like that uh, that can do. Um, uh, uh, you know, can do more for us. One of the things we found out of this is there's no shortage of, of Americans will, to, willing to step forward and volunteer for things. But what there is, there is, there is a problem with how those people get get to the point of need. And so one of the recommendations we do make in this is the, esta the establishment of a volunteer aggregator uh, that, you know, provides, a, you know, through an app form or, some, or a website, uh, there are a variety of different forms it can take where people can actually get on and volunteer and then be directed in the, in the, in the, in the right way. I don't, we don't, I don't think that's something the government needs to do. I think there's organizations out there that can probably do this, but we need to, we need to do a better job of leveraging those type of resources uh, that are so essential to responding to these kind of crises. Sort of a COVID core. Well, yeah, we call it a, we, we would call it a, a, a civilian expertise uh, reserve, if you will, uh, loosely modeled after the National Guard. Uh, it, you know, th there are a couple different categories of this. I mean, there are certain people that have emergency skills that have to be refined, that are they're in short supply. Uh, and they, we really have to, we have to know about those. And we have to be able to leverage them quickly. And we ought to incentivize people. We ought to incentivize businesses uh, to support that kind of stuff. And then there's the broader volunteers, you know, people that are labor and can do things for us, but they, they don't necessarily have specialized capabilities. They just have the willingness to help. And that's important as well. And that can be helped, that can be helped through, through the volunteer aggregator and the civilian expertise reserve could, could handle some of the more sophisticated uh, technical skills that are needed for emergencies. Well, I think a lot of people wanted to help, but didn't even know how to plug in. There was a sense that, I mean, I think when Team America will show up, if Team America knows what role it's needs to play. That's right. And that's the whole point. That's the whole point. We have to have a way of, of, of bringing all that together and getting people, getting people's interest and efforts focused at the, at the most important locations. And that's for me, David, how it ties back to healthcare, because if we don't have this connective tissue and, and or spinal structure to lean on in a crisis, I don't think our healthcare system, which we have the, we have the best you know, public lab system in the world, we've got the best CDC in the world. We've got the best hospitals in the world. We've proven through the, the, the vaccine program that we can actually invent and deploy at scale quickly. Uh, but without those other, those other parts of emergency response, I, I think they're, they're, disconnected. they're disconnected from the body of the, of the, that, that you need to put together in order of, 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 to, to respond at scale. John, I thought it was interesting that the report mentioned a couple of things that were related to the conversation you and I had about infrastructure and its role in healthcare uh, earlier. One, two of these were in the leveraging technology section of the recommendations. One was about connecting every American, and the other one was keeping pace with security and technology advances. Can you explain how that fits in? Sure, absolutely. So when we started this out, when we started our commission, we actually focused uh, our Ben's members and some outside experts in really five different areas. We looked at supply, we looked at surge, we looked at human resources, we looked at roles and responsibilities, and we looked at infrastructure. And frankly, when we when we stepped into that, we actually thought we'd be looking at more what people think more traditional about the infrastructure, roads and railways and airports and things like that. But what we very quickly arrived at was the infrastructure that is most vulnerable to us is the digital is our digital economy, uh, and it's our our reliance on on digits to communicate to 
do everything uh, for us. And uh, and what we came to recognize was that uh, we had a, we had real inability to share information between local, state, and federal uh, level. Um, it was ex- it's extraordinarily difficult to have a com what you know those of us in the military would call a common operating picture about what was happening in a particular area. All of that, of course, is driven by data, but yet we we lack the ability to pull all of that effectively together and and use it to help drive decisions and policy making at the national or state level. Uh, and this so this really really highlights it. I mean, a lot of the uh, we talked to a number of uh, state emergency managers. Uh, as part of this, and uh, you know what we what we came away with is we did have a variety of outdated systems. Um, I mean, all of these have to be updated routinely. We're really we're really hedging our bets uh, if we don't do this. Uh, and so you've got to get these things updated. We've got to establish commonalities for how we share information in times of emergency. Uh, there's there's at least 50 different ways we're doing it out there right now uh, with all of the states. And as you mentioned, uh, uh, when when the pandemic struck and people didn't go to where we're working from home, uh, they're, they're going to school from home, they're getting their information from home. Uh, the fact that, uh, that somewhere between 19 and 40 million American families don't have reliable access to broadband is a real problem. Uh, when you can't when you can't get on and access information, you can't get your kids to school, you can't work from home. This this exacerbates the problem. And uh, this was a really strong point in the commission, and to the point where some of our commissioners really viewed this as a right for Americans to have a uh, to have a, you know access to the reliable broadband. And there's a huge amount of interest on this topic in in and of itself in Congress right now, just to try to address this broadband issue. Well, and I think I think once you get everyone connected with broadband, which is, which is ab- absolutely necessary, the other thing we have to solve for is data standardization and access in healthcare specifically, because from a, from a healthcare national security perspective, we have to have visibility. It's like, you, you can't be blind to the, to the, to the, to the enemy you're fighting with, with it, when you're fighting this kind of a virus. And today we really don't, we as a system don't have a way to systematically grabbing that data, I guess, unless you were to somehow twist the defense production act into some role that you would build and then, and then just require folks to, to report it, but there really isn't an easy way today to know how many people are hitting which one of the five or six thousand e- emergency rooms with what conditions at, at on any on any given day, and th- and that that means we are relatively blind. Yeah, no, I think this is uh, this is an absolutely essential aspect of this trying to trying to create uh, you know common tools between different levels of emergency management as we as we share information and you you're I know you're focused on the healthcare information here which is absolutely vital in this uh, is I think is is essential to this I, you know I would just share with you on the technology piece I think one of the other areas we focused in on was you know this idea of modeling. Uh, I know early on there were a lot of different models being developed by academic uh, institutions and businesses and others uh, across the country here, uh, and they got better as time went on. But we need a more mature modeling uh, capability as well, and that I think gets into the kind of the digital aspect of this, the, the ability to model and understand what's happening based on the data that's coming in uh, is is absolutely essential, especially when we're trying to trying to wrest control over a, over something like a pandemic. One of the things that I really liked about the report was the specificity of the recommendations, which uh, lend themselves being incorporated into policy, into legislation. Sounds like that may already be happening. I did note there was another broader and kind of a vague thing, but it may be particularly important, which is about the role of trust. You mentioned early on about how the pandemic response became politicized, and you noted the importance of building trust. And I'm wondering, how important is that? You know, how do you do that, especially now? Yeah, well, I think you're hitting on, uh, I think on perhaps one of the key challenges of the whole pandemic here, and that is that there was, uh, there were, there were, we did not have great trustful relationships between multiple levels, uh, between multiple levels of government, and then in some cases between uh, the different sectors, public, private, civil, and I think that that does that does slow it down. Trust is really what what 
brings those different levels, those different sectors together, and allows them to uh, to uh, you know to to, to focus uh, on the, on the problem at hand. I, I am up from my own personal view here, my own experience with trust again through largely through a military lens, but I think it's I think it's universally uh, the same. Is that you know I think it requires that people at on at, at both sides of the trust equation here to listen, understand before they start responding, understand what people are telling you. I think it's I think it's absolutely essential to invest in relationship building. That is why the routineness of relationships with business, relationships with state and local uh, emergency managers is so important. You know, I worked for a boss, my bo- one my boss one time was Bill McCraven. Uh, of you know Osama bin Laden uh, fame here, but you know what he used to always say is you cannot surge trust in a crisis. That has got to be developed beforehand by investing in relationships. And when we don't do that, we can't expect people to immediately uh, enter into trusting relationships if we haven't done the work up front. And then finally, I think what's absolutely key for uh, for trust is to is to be responsive to people and to be inclusive of their views and opinions, data, information, other things into the bigger problem. Uh, everybody, I think, could, can agree we wanted we wanted to address this quickly, uh, but yet we were unable to do that. And I do think trust and lack of trust played a, played a significant factor in this case. John, last question to you. So, where do these recommendations stand? If people if people agree with agree with you and and, and agree with what we're bloviating on, how do we actually what, what how do we turn uh, the the ideas? into reality? That's a great question. So, you know, Ben's is not a think tank. We think of ourselves as a do tank. So we're really focused on trying to trying to force implementation of this. And so what we've done is we've been engaging with Congress. Uh, I've, I've testified we've, and we've had other members testify on a couple of the different occasions here uh, to various committees up on the Hill. Uh, we had, as part of our commissioners, we had two U.S. senators, Senator Hassan and Senator Cassidy uh, were both commissioners. And they have been extraordinary champions for us and are actually drafting and moving legislation now related to uh, related to our recommendations. We've also reached out to the National Governors Association. We've had several sessions with them, talking to emergency managers in each of the states uh, and trying to share the ideas with them. Uh, we'll, we'll be meeting with uh, uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency's National Advisory Council actually tomorrow uh, to talk with them about this, and we've talked with people in the administration. So it's an all hands, all 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 domain approach here to trying to get uh, trying to get the recommendations out. And what we'll do is we'll we'll watch the progress as they as they move forward and and apply effort where we need to to kind of keep these things moving forward. Well, that's it for yet another edition of Care Talk. I'm David Williams, president of Health Business Group. And I'm John Driscoll, the CEO of Care Centrics. Thank you, General Votel, for joining us.